completely dedicated volunteers. Yeah. Each year. Like this couple of men that started it. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, they're no longer involved with it. No? They've, they've all moved on. Oh boy. Um, but as people go on, more people step up sure. to uh, make the event. So. Podcast Pittsburgh. Podcast. And no, and no suffix necessary. Yeah. Six or seven. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Now, is it likely that this will that there will also be a podcast next year? Uh huh. Well, good. Thank you. And we're doing a little bit of a pivot, so there's some big news coming here in the next couple of weeks that other people inform our biggest more broadly across.
Sorry, give me a second. Yeah. It's making me download Google Chrome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is this the yeah, yeah, this is crowdsourcing. I missed any of you earlier. So it's being ornery, uh, as, as expected, right? Because, you know, I guess I can turn these lights down a little. So I am uh, Josh Lucas, and I may not be smart enough to work the lights, but we'll see. I think it's the other end. It's the other side. <laughs> this side. Okay, so I'm going to do a projector. How about that? Oh, look at that. Oh, now it's a little too intimate. Okay, but we'll, uh, we'll deal with it. Uh, and we do weird, weird stuff. We, we uh, live in the crowd, sourcing crowdfunding space, and we have a lot of emphasis on serving nonprofits, so that's why I'm here today, is to help you guys figure out this thing called crowdsourcing and how it might be put to use to help you secure resources and better uh, serve your communities, right? Okay, so um, actually, Jocelyn's not even here today, but that has, uh, let's see if I can make this work. Yeah. Oh. 
this is the wrong power point. That's why I'm confused. Give me one second. Podcamp. That's what we're doing today. Sorry. Okay, so none of that stuff I told you changed. I'm still Josh Lucas. Um, so yeah, uh, I guess I want to get a sense of, of who you are. I know memes are so played out, but I still love memes. I can't help myself. I have to play mine. So uh, if you're a nonprofit, just I guess wave at me or raise your hand, jumping jacks. Uh, bloggers, you guys, bloggers, the rest of you, entrepreneurs. An artist who works for non. An artist who works for nonprofits. Uh, anything that I missed? Any catch-all that you'd like to shout out so I can better frame this conversation to help you understand? A for-profit that works exclusively with nonprofits. For-profit works exclusively with nonprofits. Who, who are you with? Uh, Tower Care Technologies. We make a product called Donor Pro. Oh, cool! Awesome. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, crowdsourcing is obviously a, a big deal these days and stands to get even bigger and bigger and bigger. So um, we'll go through it in, in whatever depth or level that you guys want to do it on. Um, so we'll, we'll go through the basics um, and we'll talk about specific benefits that, that nonprofits are seeing from using this sort of approach to fundraising. And we'll talk briefly about best practices based on what we've seen works and what the community uh, as a whole on the internet, the community, I mean the internet, uh, says works. So I, I kind of know who you are, so what, what do you want to get out of this? Can somebody shout out like why you're here, what your thinking is, and what motivates you to come to this talk? Me? Sure. I get vocabulary. You get vocabulary, okay. So you're just kind of on that level where you're trying to learn the, 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 the way to have the conversation about it? Go ahead. I'm with the Jewish Republic Transit. Okay. Okay. So we've got a really broad audience, a broad, uh, broad set of needs, yeah. and we want to be able to really be respectful and to engage all those groups, those types of people. Anybody else from the share? Go ahead. Try to uh, do more targeted campaigns towards actual things that are needed with what we do. Okay. Um, I remember like a good example is we're trying to help a hospital uh, buy a sterilizer. So they can start hosting more medical missions there, and so something like that. How can we okay. get people towards geared towards that particular thing? Okay, cool. Uh, by by trade, I'm a, I'm a teacher, so I, I I can't sit here without picking at you. So I'm going to call on you and, and agitate you. I, I can't give this talk without you. So there's a lot of chance for you to talk back at me today, and that'll make for a richer conversation. I, I hope. So let's do that right now. Let's make a new friend. It's called Think Peer Share. <laughs> uh, get it. Take a second to introduce yourself to the person next to you, and and try to ha hash out what you hope to get out of this. Your worries about crowdfunding and crowdsourcing, maybe the needed resources that you don't have. Uh, just take a minute and do that real quick for me, so we all know who we are. Don't make me sit by. Give you a Hi. 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 It's the idea that total strangers come together and satisfy it. It be a financial need, it be an intellectual need. Do you work for it? Why are you scared about the team? Why are you being needed? So there's all these websites out there that are facilitating the process. I work for it. Whoever you can get on board. No, no, it's your virtual experience. It's an internet job. I have a common buzz if they want to check it out. Okay, let me bring you back. So yeah, this gentleman was just asked me, you know, what is what is crowdsourcing, right? When it, when it comes down to it, it's this idea that lots of small contributions can have a giant effect. And they don't have to be money necessarily, right? Like they can be uh, ideas, they can be talent, they can be uh, any number of, of collaborations. And what the internet has given us, and it's given us so much, 
uh, the internet has given us the chance to make this an efficient process. And so we're seeing all these websites popping up into GoTo, Kickstarter, Rally.org, Donors Choose, Red Blue Boys, that's my point, uh, uh, all trying to get into this new space of crowdsourcing. So we'll talk about all these different kinds of crowdsourcing, and we'll try to focus it in on you, the audience, and whether you're a nonprofit, and how you can use these kind of subcategories, right? So there's crowd creative, the idea that you can use the creative talents of the people in your community to fix something that's broken. And then we see kind of an offshoot of that. We see big corporations using their customer base to develop marketing strategies and to develop advertisements and to develop content um, that's going to be more compelling than what their internal marketing department, departments can develop, right? Because those folks are out of touch. All they do is thinking about selling you product, right? But the customer really knows what they want. Then we'll talk about crowd idea, how there are um, big problems being solved in the third world uh, through collective action of just contributing uh, not just talent, but intellectual energy as well, whether you're an engineer, a lawyer, an accountant, you know, there's things like that, right? And then probably the most interesting, and I'll save it to last because then I know that I have your attention, uh, is crowdfunding, right? That's probably why you're in the room. Like, how can I tap into what seems to be a limitless resources, resource of other people's money to do something good, to do something that I think is important, is going to motivate and change my community? So that's where we'll go. And, and if we have time, I'll talk about the Jobs Act in case you're an entrepreneur in the room who wants to use crowdfunding to fund their startup, which is a whole other thing. Ah, the Pebble Watch. The most successful crowd camp, crowdfunding campaign in history. So let's measure all of our progress from there, right? These guys, or this guy, I can't say his last name. It looks like it's something Polish, but he's not from Pittsburgh as far as I know. <laughs> Raised like $10 million to make these watches. And he did it on Kickstarter. And he did it in a very short period of time. And so everybody went, wow, Kickstarter is the best thing ever. This guy with a stylish watch was able to raise enough capital to go and make his product. And now he's going to be successful for the rest of eternity because he has had this injection of beautiful, epic amounts of capital. Uh, but I think some of you probably already know it hasn't worked out exactly that way, right? Some things you might not know. Before he did that Kickstarter campaign, he had already raised about $400,000 in startup capital <coughs> the traditional way through angel investing or through uh, you know, local friends and family, right? So he already had some sort of capacity before he even went to Kickstarter. And that's an important lesson that we're going to follow through this presentation if I don't run out of time. The other thing you may not know is he has yet to deliver a product. So that is the big elephant in the room for crowdfunding, right? And it's the thing that's going to make crowdfunding less and less appealing as the days and the weeks and the years drag on. If all of these folks are out there trying to tap into this capital resource, uh, what's the backlash going to be if you guys and me and the people that are making these campaigns aren't satisfying their commitments? And this is the big one, right? Because whatever happens with this guy is going to make national news over and over again. So now, $10,375,000 later, no product, and everybody's still waiting for the promise that was delivered around the, the crowdfunding campaign. Um, so that's a, a reality of crowdfunding that I think you should consider as we go through some of the nuts and bolts of it all, right? The idea that um, if you choose to participate in this, there are going to be barriers to success, and then there's going to be some kind of accountability on the back end even if it's just uh, sort of um, communal accountability, right? If we're all messing up and not delivering uh, the product that we're saying we're going to deliver, eventually this whole idea of crowdfunding is going to get a bad name and a bad rap, and it's going to become another tool that isn't as useful as, as it could be. So Kickstarter, right? Kickstarter is like the premier uh, crowdfunding site right now. Uh, they have a screening process. If you want to upload a campaign to Kickstarter, uh, you have to be approved by the Kickstarter administrators. They have to say, yes, your campaign is good. Your campaign is valid. It has merit. And then they put it up on the site, and only about 50% of those uh, get funded, typically, right? And then Kickstarter's rival, or at least emerging rival, is this site called Indiegogo. 
and they have much looser, much more liberal approach to what campaigns they allow to be posted for funding and what campaigns they, they disallow. Um, and as far as I can tell, I couldn't find a hard number on this, about two-thirds of those uh, projects fail, so only about a third of them are successfully funded. The difference between the two um, is quite a bit, actually, in their fee structures, there's a lot of difference, and also uh, just in their general approach. Kickstarter is about satisfying uh, an art project, whether that's a multimedia project or uh, something in the arts, could be anything, right, or a, or a product line, something that you're going to manufacture and then give back to the, the people, right? Indiegogo is uh, whatever you want, however you want to do it. Okay, and we've already kind of talked about that. And so I think that what, what I'm trying to allude to here is that there's this storm approaching. There's this chance. Yes, there's this perfect storm emerging where it's either going to be make or break for crowdfunding. And uh, not just the Frankenstorm that's blowing up the coast right now. But if we're not careful stewards of this idea, if we don't think about uh, what makes crowdfunding successful and what's making it not successful, then uh, I fear that it's going to get a bad reputation and it's going to deprive everybody of a really, really cool resource. So that was my attempt at humor. I have a bad sense of humor. <laughs> so things that you might want to think about as you uh, do crowdfunding, right? Like if you're in this room and you're at PodCamp, you probably already have a pretty good idea what crowdfunding is. But I can tell you as an owner-operator of a crowdfunding website, most people out there, the normals, have no idea what crowdfunding is. They have no idea how to interact with it. They don't understand the premise behind it. There is a real intellectual barrier to entry for anybody, say, over 30. So it's not going to be this magic fix that you might hope it's going to be. If you think you're just going to throw up a bunch of campaigns on Kickstarter or on Red Blue Voice or on Indiegogo and instantly have the reward of capital or cash inflow, you're probably wrong. It takes a lot of work to make one of these crowdfunding campaigns successful because you still have to be an advocate. You still have to go and knock on doors, whether they're virtual or they're real doors, and you have to convince people that you're not shady, right? That you're doing this for a reason, for a good reason, and that you are um, going to follow through with your idea. And then crowdsourcing has some big legal growing pains that they're going to encounter, right? Like, so let's say this Pebble watch guy doesn't ever deliver those Pebble watches, right? He raised $10 million. You know, that's hundreds of thousands of individual don donors gave this guy money. So they're probably going to sue him, <laughs> I would think, right? Like somebody's going to have a class action lawsuit for one of these big failures, and it, it's going to change the nature of Kickstarter. It's going to change the nature of Indiegogo, right? And then there's all sorts of social and cultural sort of collateral damage, too, that nobody's considering. So let's all be dark and maniacal. Think how somebody could use crowdfunding for evil instead of good. Anybody have a particularly dark? Okay. A little dark inner dark maybe? No. <laughs> Go ahead. Start a presidential campaign. Sure, okay. Politics, right? Red Blue Voice was created so that we could run political ads, crowdfunded political ads. That's why we created the website, to kind of counter Citizens United. We created it so that Ken could come and five of his friends could run political ads in Pennsylvania in a battleground state during the election saying whatever he wanted uh, as a way to sway the popular vote. So you can see how that could be misused, right? Kiva.org early on uh, was a popular uh, crowdsourcing site. Uh, they provided micro loans to the third world. So if you were a third world entrepreneur, uh, Kiva would provide you access to the rest of the world to fund whatever your need was, whether it was uh, to buy feed for your cattle or, or seeds for your crops or to stock your store in, in whatever country you live, happen to live in. But the criticism being levied against Kiva early on was that how do we know this money is not going to terrorist organizations? How do we know that these American housewives who are shuffling off thousands of dollars to Pakistan to fund this guy's uh, you know, market, corner of the, of the public market, isn't secretly funding uh, some other insidious organization. So transparency is going to be a big issue in the coming years, I think. <clears throat> are, there, are there any lawyers that specialize in this? I'm sure there are. Yes, I'm sure they're out there. Yeah, there's lawyers for everything. Um, the startup folks, the startup lawyers in town are, are pretty up on this because of this thing called the Jobs Act that's coming that's going to allow you to crowdfund equity in your company. It's a big rule change. 
uh, up until about, well, previous, prior to this rule change, the only people that could invest in startups were accredited investors that have a net worth of over a million dollars. Uh, this is gonna change everything, make it so that mom, grandma, cousin Eddie can roll out of the Winnebago and uh, fund your startup. And the, the, the idea is that that's gonna stimulate growth. The downside is that you may be hustling cousin Eddie, Eddie and he may lose his retirement savings, right? So yeah, there are definitely lawyers that are looking at this very closely. So as we go through all this, keep these things in mind. As you think about your own crowdfunding campaigns and your own needs that you're trying to satisfy, uh, you know, think about what it's gonna be in five years, in two years or three years. Okay, so crowd creative, it's kind of a subcategory. It's the idea that you use people's talent to satisfy a satisfy need. Do you need graphic design done for your website? Do you need a logo for your business? Do you need a piece of music composed. There are websites out there that will allow you to solicit the masses to satisfy that need. Some are for free. The guy who stars in Looper, what's that guy's name? The actor in Looper. Oh. That guy, he's got one. He wants you to go and create media and create content and then share that media and share that content and do awesome things with it. Um, so if you're a nonprofit, this may have value to you, right? You probably don't have the money necessary to go and hire a graphic designer every time you guys want to do a mailer or every time you want to update, refresh your website, right? So there are these websites that exist that collect graphic designers, that collect artists, collect talent. And at the very best, it's free. Uh, and, and if not, it's at least a reduced rate because it's open competition. Yes, sir? So the difference between like an Elance and these are that these are free or that they're very much reduced? That's right, because it's often offshore talent, right? So if you go to 99designs, you may be dealing with a, uh, an Indian or Chinese graphic designer, and he's going to be able to offer his services at a reduced rate, right? So there again is a cultural repercussion of crowdsourcing that you're probably not thinking about, right? It's going to make offshoring domestic talent easier, right? And I'll, um, if anybody wants to link to this, this presentation, uh, you can scribble your email address down. I'll, I'll email it to you. So yeah, um, you tell me. What are the, tell me some more ups and downs. I'm, I want to make this as interactive as possible, right? So when you think of that idea of crowd creative, so we talked about offshoring, but what else? What's the upside of that? Class? Well, the other thing with 99designs is it's competitive. OK. You have lots of people who, pro who provide 50 different graphic idea 50 different graphic ideas versus Elance where you go and you choose someone based on their resume. Okay, so it's an up, right? You're not just hiring a graphic designer off the street that you hope is going to fit your brand, fit your idea, right? Let's go ahead. Uh, this is a downside. Mm -hmm. I think uh, because of nonprofit, to quote that phrase from State Farm, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Yeah. As a, as a nonprofit, you can't be basically like... Uh, doing cutthroat business with someone from Bangladesh for uh, $3 a, you know, a project, and then still say you're a, a nonprofit helping people in Pittsburgh or something. We're also going to see how well I spell, by the way, as I do this, the red line, things like that. <laughs> Go ahead. You know a town. But I'm, you know what I'm saying, though? Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I agree. A downside I always worry about is, in order to interest people in my project, I have to really describe it. And by doing that, I'm giving away a really original ideas that I feel someone can just copy or plagiarize, um, like my competitors or somebody. Okay, so that off. I'm inhibited about that. Uh, Any comments about that, or does it sound ungenerous? Or well, um, sure. If you put something on the internet, it's the internet. It's not yours anymore. As much as you'd like it to be yours, it stops being yours to some degree. Um, I know as we've gone through our startup, right, the mistake I made, this is nothing to do with that, the mistake I made early on was being too clingy of my idea, thinking that my idea was more important and more powerful than it actually was, and that if I would go out there and just whisper it to the wrong person's ear, it would all be squandered. But the process is so complicated that your idea is just a small seed and it's everything that follows is going to make or break your success. There's nothing really, it's not as important maybe as much value as you're putting on it. It's what you do after the idea that's going to make Or how you use the idea. Yeah, exa exactly. Anybody else got pluses and bonuses? Go ahead. This is the kind of counter that and add to what you said. 
um, you know, there, there's more people being creative and putting things out there so their creativity doesn't go to waste. It's put out into a larger crowd and, and hopefully used, like you said, kind of not cling to the idea, putting it out there. Is that good? Can I sum it up? Yeah, sum it. Yeah, and I think to piggyback on that, I think of the fact like if, if you get um, if you get a project crowdfunded, um, you basically have a, a street team. You have people who are excited about your project because they're part of it and want to help it uh, keep momentum and want to help it um, get it out to other people via word of mouth, and they follow the project through the whole life of the project. Yes, sir. On the creative side, ideas are plentiful, S therefore a lot of, it seems like a good font of information and, and, and innovation. But discipline and, and execution are scarce, so that's the takeaway, that's what's uh, necessary, both. Okay, so would you call that a, an up or a down? Both. The, both. You know, the one is, uh, is a down and the, and the other, well, I don't know. I guess the down would be false. Sense of accomplishment? Is that fair? A dearth of, of such talent. Yeah. 